All right, well, welcome. And thank you for being part of our session um, on how to transform your organization through business process reengineering. My name is Ron Harris. I'm a director with Cambria Solutions in Sacramento. Um, and I'm honored to be your host for today's session. And I'm joined by a very esteemed, a, a very esteemed group of panel members. Um, our agenda for today, I'm going to introduce each of our speakers in just a minute. Um, then I want to start off by talking a little bit about business process reengineering and why that's important and what does it mean to rethink and redesign. And then we're going to move into a panel discussion um, and really talk about some of the key drivers to enable transformation. And then we'll save some time at the end and wrap up with some questions and answers. So with that, let me start off by introducing our first panel member, Greg Williams. Um, Greg is the Deputy Director at the um, Employment Development Department. He's the Director of Administration. And he oversees human resources, labor relations, fiscal programs, and business operations. Greg also formerly served as the Chief Operating Officer at the uh, Department of State Hospitals. Next, we have Janine Dodson. Janine is the Director's Office Project Manager, also at EDD. And she provides high-level consultation on business process analysis, workforce planning, strategic planning, and leadership development, as well as other enterprise-level functions. She currently serves as the uh, project manager for the Unemployment Insurance Branch's Business Process Innovation Project. Next, <laughs> got a few fans out there. <laughs> Next, we have Jerry Higgs. Jerry um, is a project director over several business um, improvement projects at the Department of Water Resources. Uh, she leads a, a diverse group of um, stakeholders also in her role as the uh, chief over their um, SAP Center of Services branch. Last, we have Andrea Hoffman. <laughs> Andrea is currently the uh, project manager for the State Technology and Approval Reform Project, also known as the STAR Project with the um, California Department of Technology. Um, Andrew, Andrea has successfully managed the uh, policy release of the STAR Stage 1 Business Analysis as well as Stage 2 Alternatives Analysis. So she'll talk to us a little bit more about that later on. Um, and in her roles with government, she has worked on both the business and the technology side. So she's able to bring that to a lot of the projects and programs that she oversees. So with that, let me talk for just a minute about business process reengineering and why this is um, important. As you all are probably aware, agencies are always challenged to reduce the cost of government, while at the same time improving performance, accountability, and overall organizational outcomes essentially being asked to do a lot more with a lot less. Well, the power to transform an organization is unleashed really through end-to-end -end business processes that maximize the integrated potential of people, process, and technology. Well, during today's session, we want to focus on four key drivers that really help enable transformation. First off, I'm going to talk a bit about business process improvement versus re-engineering. What is the difference? And why does it matter? Second, we're going to engage our panel members and really dive into the topic of how do you break away from outmoded operations, fears of change, outdated cultural paradigms, risk or failure, and really focus on how you generate or incubate fresh new ideas to rethink and redesign. And then third, we're going to continue with our panel discussion and really talk about how does BPR, or business process design activities, how does that fit in with the IT project approval life cycle? And more specifically, how does it fit in with the STAR project? Okay, so maybe some of you have heard about that. Um, if not, Andrea will um, share quite a bit to help, help bridge that gap. And really throughout our session, we want to focus on providing you some real advice and just some real key takeaways um, on how to be a positive change agent and really just make it in a practical sense through real life experiences from our panel members. So let me talk for just a moment a bit more about business process reengineering. You know, you've probably heard some of these terms, process improvement, process reengineering, process redesign. Hate to admit it, but at times it does sound, you know, B BPR reengineering, it does sound a bit cliche. <coughs> but the truth is, reengineering, it started um, in the private sector as a technique to help organizations fundamentally rethink 
how they do their work in order to dramatically improve customer service, cutting the cost of operations, improving quality, and ultimately becoming world-class leaders and competitors in whatever field they're in. Well, re-engineering itself, it really means the fundamental rethinking and redesign of business processes in order to significantly improve performance in key performance measure areas. Re-engineering itself recognizes that an operation, that, that, that an organization's business processes are usually fragmented um, into multiple sub-processes or tasks that are carried out by several different functions across an organization. So let me just give you a simple example. Ordering a piece of equipment at your agency or at your organization, it's going to require an end-to-end -end process from procuring all the way through paying. It may even go further into maintaining an asset. If you break that down into the different sub-processes, then you're really talking about requisitioning an item, issuing a purchase order, receiving that item, processing, paying for that item, and maybe even tracking and maintaining the, the uh, item as an asset. So you can see that there's quite a spectrum of uh, different activities. Well, process improvement really focuses on optimizing the individual performance or the individual sub-process, which will result in some benefit. But ideally, it may not provide the significant or dramatic improvements that one would hope for if that entire process itself is fundamentally outdated or inefficient. So then if you take a look at re-engineering, re-engineering really focuses on redesigning the process as a whole in order to achieve the greatest possible benefit to an organization and its customers. So at a high level, the main difference really does lie with the scale and scope of the effort and the ultimate benefits um, achieved. Now, for today's session, really what we want to focus on is not so much drawing the distinctions, because BPR or re-engineering or whatever you want to call it, it can be fairly academic and theoretical. But we want to really focus today on just, we'll, we'll, we'll just call it BPR loosely, um, to really refer to any improvement to a process in the form of rethinking and redesigning to achieve organizational benefits. Okay? So our goal for today really is not for me to sit here and lecture you about, you know, all the different methodologies and theories, but I really want to engage with our panel of speakers and really have them share their real life experiences and practical advice and takeaways that you can um, use and hopefully apply in your organization to make a difference. So with that, let me transition into our um, segment of panel discussions. And we want to First, focus on the topic of how do you break away from outmoded operations, fears of change, outdated cultural paradigms, whatever it is that might be holding you back, essentially finding a way to incubate uh, new ideas to rethink and redesign. So let me start off. Let me start off with you, Greg. You've been able to drive and affect real change from the top levels of an organization in your career. So let me ask you about challenging the status quo. We know that one of the most common obstacles right, at an organization is that people get stuck doing what they've been used to doing for a long time. For them, that's the only way it's ever been. Can you share some of your perspectives on this and why challenging the status quo is ultimately something that has been able to um, help you affect real change? So I love this quote that I put up there um, and attributed to Apple about uh, people who just think radically and kind of push the envelope of what's possible and because I think that's a starting point of where do you want to go and you know we live and work in a unique time in government and um, it was interesting because this is my notes and Secretary Badger was saying it this morning which is uh, uh, the demands of government exceed its capacity the workforce of tomorrow uh, demands to be doing relevant work we have to change the status quo because we have no choice we're at a point where we fiddle farted around and we can't be doing that anymore. Now it's a time to really be thinking more uh, radically. So, um, so we either keep running harder and faster, working long hours, doing overtime, have these processes that don't serve the need, or we stop, step back, and take a look at what we're doing. So 
um, looking beyond the the um, the processes of the things we're doing to the service delivery from the beginning to the end what are we doing for the citizens of California and um, I was thinking about you know I'm deputy of admin oftentimes kind of a droll function you know make sure the engine keeps running you know there's enough money in the tank and people to do the things that are need to be done and so I feel very fortunate to be working for an organization that has smart people that make sure everything gets, uh, is still running. So I get to do these kinds of things. Awesome. So, um, so at, as at EDD, I tether myself to the mission. So the mission is to help um, uh, enhance California's economic growth and um, prosperity. And I've also worked uh, for state hospitals. It was dealing with the clinical care of people who are mentally ill. And I worked in fish and game, or fish and wildlife, where you know it's my, managing a wildlife resources. But it doesn't really matter. The issue is you tether yourself to the mission, to the purpose for existing, and then you start digging from there. So um, I focus my energies on communication and engagement. I look at uh, a tangible thing, you know, like saving elk, you know, or ensuring care of mentally ill or making sure people are getting jobs and start from there. When I was at um, Fish and Wildlife, I had a, uh, I was put over the business service function. I didn't know anything about business services. And we're just kind of, you know, pattering it out. You kind of jump in the room, you start the conversation, you get people starting, starting talking. And one of the things I kept <coughs> bubbling up was, you know, you need stuff to manage resources. You need tractors, you need equipment. No one had any idea what we had out there. I mean, and I heard this story about this tree growing up through a tractor somewhere in some property somewhere. And so we had to start keeping track of what we had. So we hadn't done a state with inventory. So what's that take? It takes the pe they already knew what to do. I just had to help link them to the resources and get the permissions and all that kind of stuff. At um, mental health, it was about um, engaging in uh, care for mentally ill. And then suddenly it shifted. In 2010, there was a, um, a staff member who was murdered by a patient and everything shifted towards violence. And, and so when the, when the department shifted, we shifted and everything became focused on safety and all the labor issues and all those kinds of things. And so um, it, it completely had to shift. So we shifted along with it and we helped drive the, uh, the technical parts of the change. One of the things I was noticing even from the talks is that a lot of the stuff we're talking about in transformation isn't sexy. It's kind of like it's the little things that become big things we're not attended to. At EDD, we do uh, things in volume. When I came over here, I was like, whoa. I mean, the smallest little differences we make make these dramatic differences. I mean, we, we cut out a form and save wait, $800,000 or something. Crazy. So when uh, so I come over to EDD, and we have, uh, we have uh, this US system that had a little bit of issues. And so um, they, we assembled this business process team led by Janine, which I'll talk about. And, um, and started looking holistically at the service delivery. We're looking at what we're delivering for Californians. So it starts by tethering to the purpose, to the mission, to what we're trying to do, and then working through the variables with the people who know what to do. So, uh, oh, I love this quote by Goethe. Whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. That's one of my mantras. Um, so, um, it requires energy and inspiration. Sometimes you need, uh, you feel like a salmon spawning upstream, but um, you know, I read a lot, I reach out to other departments, and I find other people who are really uh, jazzed about doing the right thing. Thanks, Greg. You know, one of the things I wanted to ask you about as well is empowering process owners. Um, you know, sometimes uh, an overall process, as I alluded to earlier, may or may not have a, a somebody who's focused on the overall performance of that process. Can you speak a little bit to why that's important from your experience? My next slide. I, I, uh, I uh, was introduced to this uh, gentleman uh, by uh, one of the leaders in our department it's back in the back room. It's been, uh, named Ken Miller, and Ken Miller writes these books about government and uh, innovation and uh, effectively um, uh, making government work. And he, this is a quote that he says, but um, I believe that what he says is that the people who have the ability to change are the people who are working in the pipes. People who know really what's going on. And um, so what are the pipes? The pipes are the, it's a process, the system, the, the inner workings of things and how they uh, work. And I think that we have this uh, idea sometimes that at the top we're supposed to like wave a magic wand and solve all the woes through some new process. And the hard part about things like business process, reengineering, or TQM or whatever is that it, 
it, it starts to develop this kind of numb factor. And so it's like, to me, even when we're talking about this, not to get too attached to the terminology, but it's really about the, you know, the organic nature of business and government and trying to do the right thing. So uh, at one department, we had this process where we went through, I call it four laps around the building to do a contract. So we had the, the idea lap, and then the concept lap, and then the, you know, the initial review lap, and then the final signature lap. And I was like, this is nuts. And so we started assembling a team and looking through it and, um, and reduced the numbers. But the issue is, I feel like if I spend too much time thinking about, like I walk into a meeting and I don't know much about the issue at hand, um, I try to create an environment where people feel like free to move about the country. Um, they're, um, they're empowered, ability, to, they have, I have some kind of structured way to get the information from them so that they uh, move this information up through, and Jean may talk a little more about that than her team answer. Um, I don't know everything. Uh, I came into EDD about a year ago. I know government, I know people, I know about delivery of the right thing to the right people. As again, I tell them myself to the mission. Um, the issue for me is don't be redundant yourself as a leader. If you have to know everything, then one of you doesn't need to be there, right? If you know the exact same stuff as your staff, what are you there for, right? So as a leader, you're leading the process. You get the smart people up, you get the right pieces of information from them in, into the, uh, the end result. And as I said, too often, um, <laughs> he doesn't like when I say this part, but too often we hire consultants to, to come and tell us, hey, what's wrong, you know? And, and there's lots of that. Don't get, there's plenty of work for everybody. But we, you know, and we go and it's like a therapist. You know, what's going on? What's wrong? We tell them and then they repeat, you know, in the end, repeat back to us the solution that we came up with. So there's no magic pill, but if there is a magic pill, it's in the process owners. It's in the people who really know what's going on, what's really happening, and trying to find ways of getting that information to bubble up to us. Um, so uh, find those energetic people who want to improve things, give them space and the tools, allow them to speak, seek input, make it safe to speak, allow them input in the little things as well as the big things. Uh, be authentic, be accessible, be you know genuine person. And, um, and I had a, 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 a Forbes article when I was digging, I thought I should have something academic here. So Forbes says, how to empower employees with transformational leadership, encourage in the moment feedback, cultivate an executive mentality by sharing the large happenings in the organization. Uh, present new challenges and opportunities, uh, allow them to re achieve, uh, employees to achieve their full potential. Respect boundaries, give them flexibility, and don't babysit. Um, you give people, give your uh, staff some space, allow them to uh, flounder even a little bit. Um, little things matter. Um, a lot of little things add up to a some big things. And um, I think sometimes we want to do some big thing that costs a lot of money, we can save and be a superhero. But uh, a lot of little things become your superhero stuff. So, um, you know, it's a great time to be in government. Um, I think we have the ability right now, uh, during the next uh, several years, to make an impact that will last far beyond our years in government. So I'm, I'm excited. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate that. Next, I want to talk about assembling the right. I want to talk about assembling the right can-do team. Um, Janine, I know you've been able to accomplish and lead um, a great deal of BPR improvements in your role over at EDD. Um, but I know from our conversations that you have an excellent team that is with you. Um, can you speak a little bit about what makes your team so effective and how have you been able to build that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I'm going to actually start by asking a few questions of the audience. Um, how many of you would consider yourselves to be passionate? Good. How many would you con um, consider yourselves to be genuine? Enthusiastic? Good, good. Do you wake up in the morning and you're, you're excited to get to work every day? <laughs> yeah, it depends on the day. Yeah, I get it, I get it. All right. Consider yourselves genuine. Excellent, excellent. Do you consider yourselves committed and dedicated? Yes. Okay. I would ask how many of you consider yourselves humble, but... We, we can see. <laughs> so, yeah. So one of the things that um, I've had the opportunity um, and just a great pleasure is I've led, I've been a part of, I've managed um, many teams within EDD. And those are the characteristics that as a project manager I look for. Those are the characteristics that as a team um, a member I looked for when I was an analyst. Um, and it is that genuine passion, that commitment, that dedication, 
there are other skill sets that you can teach, presentation skills, critical thinking skills, um, but with business process improvement, I think it's really, really critical to have people that actually believe in it. You, they actually have to believe in what they're doing and what they're sharing, because it can be definitely challenging at times. And um, as Secretary Batcher said this morning, it can be disruptive, and it is. And it's um, uncomfortable uh, for a lot of people. But uh, my team members, I have a great team now, uh, many of which are in the audience, I appreciate. Um, but they, they, I learned so much from them. As a project manager, yes, I lead and I manage. But uh, with, as Greg says, empowering the process owners, this is a journey that we're on together, and I respect what they bring to the team as my fellow team members. Um, and I think that they respect what I bring to the team as the project manager. And at this point, they are all running their own mini projects, and I'm their biggest cheerleader. I am their biggest fan. I am the first person that will make a phone call if they're not getting the answers that they need, if they're not getting the data that they need. Um, but that happens because we have some um, exemplary leadership at the top. And um, I could not do my job if I did not have the, um, our director, our chief deputy, our deputy directors, even from other branches that provide me support, um, want to know what's going on with our team in the UI branch. Um, we have a, a pretty tight-knit family, and I'm, I'm just really appreciative to be a part of the team. Um, with our particular team structure that we have now, we do have a core team. And I will say this, for any of the managers or um, deputy directors or division chiefs in the room that have to consider giving up your superstars, I know it's a challenge to do so, and I, I, I commend you for doing so. Because in this particular team, the division chiefs had a hard choice. They had to give up their superstars for a year and dedicate them 100% to the team. And I've been on other teams where you've had that shared, like, oh, I'm going to work 50% on my job, 50% on this particular project. And it can work. Um, it has its challenges. But I can tell you, we move at a very accelerated pace with the particular project that I'm working on now. And the fact that our core team is 100% dedicated has been phenomenal. Um, so I think that's a best practice that I would like to carry through to um, future project teams that I'm involved in and I would highly recommend for any other state agency. Um, with, with the team structure, program knowledge is helpful. Within our UI program, I came on, I'm not from the UI program, I came out of our public affairs branch um, in years past, and so my, most of my work with them was uh, marketing and outreach of programs and services. But I add that outside kind of fresh perspective. And then our team members themselves have varying degrees of knowledge and expertise. Um, and so that's, that blend is really, really uh, um, phenomenal as well. Um, some of the best practices that I feel that we've done well at EDD when we put together our teams is our onboarding. We provide a lot of mentoring and training. I know any team I'm involved in, there's a lot of mentoring and training. I'd like to be able to make that transition seamless for the team members so that they can get to work. They want to work. Um, many of the team members that were chosen, this is something they would have asked to do um, if the opportunity had presented itself. Our decision-making process is clearly, clearly communicated early on. Um, we set our ground rules. We welcome any sort of feedback, it, whether it's um, negative, although we do ask that you deliver it with respect and diplomacy. Um, but we ask for all of that, the good, the bad, the ugly, everything in between. And I think that's been really helpful as far as the growth for our team and for our organization as well. Um, and as far as sustainability, we're at a point right now where we are actually transitioning some of our team members, including myself. I will be passing on knowledge and building capacity to another program uh, project manager, and I'm really excited to be able to do that. I'd love to stay on, uh, but I'm also ready for my next opportunity. And I think that what, for those of you that do have to give up your superstars, um, think about the, uh, the opportunity to build capacity where that um, absence lies. Because I think that's another big thing, is that with my team, because they all are superstars in their respective divisions that gave opportunities um, to others that might not have been there before. So um, I think my quote here is uh, the Margaret Mead quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And I truly believe that. And I think if you're building a can-do team, you definitely want um, team members that embody that quote. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. So the other thing that's obviously very important with the right team is also having the right support within your organization. And so Jerry, I want to um, ask you for just a minute. You know, you obviously um, with DWR, it's a very large organization, and you lead a lot of the um, business improvement projects as well as the SAP Center of Services. And so you know, the thing that's, that's pretty obvious is that 
when you don't have the right support, I mean, that's a real momentum killer for some of the key projects and initiatives. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you've been able to overcome that? Good morning, or almost afternoon. Um, yes, Ron, one of the things um, that I want to start with is with any um, overcoming um, any obstacle or anything you really need for any project or any initiative, regardless of how large or how small it is, is you need executive sponsorship. And when I say executive sponsorship, a lot of people kind of think about that and say, well, you know, that's the person that gets you the budget, right? Well, it goes way beyond the budget. You really need someone, you know, from the business. And I know there are some business process owners in the audience um, from the department, from Department of Water Resources. And so they've kind of lived this. I'll just go back, you know, real quickly and say 15 years ago, the Department of Water Resources um, decided, made the uh, business decision to implement the first ERP in the state of California, which was SAP. And um, what did that mean? A lot of people didn't know what that meant, including myself. I was drafted onto the team and, you know, as a first whatever, what we call it ourselves, the 12 disciples, to go out <laughs> and um, do something that none of us really knew what we were getting into. But we quickly, quickly, quickly um, learned that if we were going to do um, implement something in technology that we really needed to change the way that we were doing business. What did that mean? That, mean we, that meant we needed to look at our processes and really determine you know, what we needed to change. And that became very emotional, um, very chaotic, um, and very scary all at once because you were talking about um, not only changing a process, but you were talking about changing people's lives, right? Changing you know, how people were doing things. So the executive sponsorship piece became very, very critical. And that didn't mean just a figurehead. And it doesn't mean a figurehead even in, this, in smaller initiatives. It means you have someone that has a vision. Like Greg said, you know, he tethers himself right to something and then and goes forth and does it and provides all the support behind it. So when you're assembling a, a team, for an, an initiative, then that executive sponsor um, is, like I said, is more than a figurehead. That executive sponsor will be that person that will be at the kickoff meeting, that will be on um, steering committees to, to look at issues, um, to remove roadblocks, and continually, continually, continually um, getting behind the vision and, and being a part of communicating the vision. So. Um, like I said, there, there's all kinds of obstacles. But if you get that, and also Janine talked about getting um, the best, or you know, those people that, that know the processes you know, on the project team, that's very hard because who wants to let their, you know, let their stars go? But when you have your stars involved in the process, um, then you're gonna get a better outcome. And you're really gonna, and, and everybody's gonna benefit from it. So what I would say is, you know, focus on this sponsorship, focus on getting, getting that sponsor, um, getting that buy-in, getting that um, person or, or, or group of people that are going to continually um, communicate the vision um, to, to, the, to, to the department or the, whoever the stakeholders are, as well as the project team. Because that, that person or that group of people can be the lifeblood and could, can really help keep the, the team energized, you know, when things get tough, because things are going to get tough, because all kinds of um, tomatoes and vegetables and other <laughs> things will be, be thrown at the team whenever you're talking about change. But keeping people, people engaged and, and committed to the vision is, is going to be key. And the executive sponsor, having a good project team, having a committed project team, um, I know you can't always get it. That, that it's optimal to have people um, commit it 100% of the time. When we did SAP at Department of Water Resources, it was 100% of the time. We were actually pulled out of our jobs and put on a special project, and your, in your first thought was, oh, no, what did I do? But, you know, so, so I mean, that, that, that's key. If you can't do that, at least get people that are committed and that are committed to change. And when I say get committed, 
Look for those people that could be your biggest, um, that don't want, you know, the change. You get them turned around and you get them into the process and you have a pretty good chance of success. Thank you, Jerry. All right, so I want to transition for just a minute. We talked about kind of how to break free um, kind of when you're stuck, right? How to kind of get things going to rethink and redesign. But let's talk about now how this idea of business process reengineering, how does that fit into the IT approval life cycle? And maybe more specifically, how does that fit into the STAR project? So, Andrea, if I could have you share just some, some, some thoughts on that, uh, it'd be much appreciated. Sure. First, I want to start to level set the audience. Um, does everyone know, or can you raise your hand if you're familiar with what IT project approval life cycle is? <laughs> okay, what about uh, the state technology approval reform project, otherwise known as STAR? Okay, so about equal, equal there. So just to put a little bit of background into place, um, the project approval life cycle um, that I'm speaking to today is related to IT or information technology projects. So in the state of California, IT projects need to be approved by the Department of Technology um, in order to move forward and invest money. Um, the, the STAR project is the state technology approval reform, and what we're really seeking to do with that project is to transform the existing project approval lifecycle project, um, which is tied to a feasibility study report. Um, so we are redoing that process into now a stage gate model. So if anyone's familiar with the feasibility study report process, that is about 30 years old. So anything in government that's 30 years old, you can imagine the challenge it is to try to change that. Um, so we are up against that, that interesting challenge, but it's, it's been successful so far by following the key elements of BPR. So we're, we're putting BPR and stretching it to the limits to change a, a, a very indoctrinated statewide process. Um, so the project approval life cycle is moving forward in a stage gate framework which will have distinct stages of approval. What does that mean? Well, that means that there's going to be more structured planning. There's going to be a guided approach for organizations to take to look at their business process re-engineering um, elements within their organization, whether it be their, their governance structure, their strategic alignment, what their business objectives are, um, and, and how you're going to measure those objectives for success. Because ultimately, it starts with the business. It's always business first before you invest in technology. Because like Glenn, Greg had said, is he had taken out a form out of, out of um, process and saved, what was it, 880,000? Big amount of money. Yeah. 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 Um, so without proper planning, you will, you will still try to automate a form that should not be in place. So business process reengineering will help you look at what you have today in your processes, your people, and your technology. And what are we doing today in order to think, rethink going forward what we need to change? Um, so that's kind of um, the philosophy behind what we're trying to do with STAR, and that's what we want to provide guidance for um, agencies and state entities to follow, to be thinking about the planning process before they think about IT, and that stage gate model will allow for that. So um, the existing process today isn't so helpful. It, it, it leaves a lot of, of questions, um, more than answers in terms of what departments need to do to prepare for an IT project. Um, so really with the stage gate, it's about collecting the right information at the right time and it's putting the right people in place at the right time and, and establishing benchmarks to make sure you're on the track to, su to success and spending the effort and time where it's important and where it's needed and not wasted effort in activities um, that aren't relevant. This is, applies to StageGate, but it also applies to BPR and, and the way we operate within our organizations, irrespective of the STAR project, irrespective of the project approval life cycle. Those are, are some key things that we should be thinking about in our everyday work that we do. Um, so really the emphasis with project approval is more upfront planning. So what it's gonna require is the business sides of the organization and the IT side of the organization to work more closely together. Historically, it's common that the IT would be out front and in front of business pushing to get the projects approved. We have found that that isn't, success, that isn't successful. That doesn't lead to pro successful project outcomes. 
you know, there's been several projects um, that have made the news um, because poor planning had taken place, and I won't mention some of them. <laughs> um, so what we want to do is structure and, and have uh, departments put emphasis on planning, establishing their business case. IT can't do that for you. It always starts with the business. Um, the, the other thing we want to look at is what areas of business pro process reengineering can we think of that STAR will impact or involve? So it's, it's your business problem and your opportunity, what your priorities are within your organization, your capacity in your organization to take on an IT project, um, the ability to identify your key stakeholders and your business owners, and what is your strategic business alignment in your organization? And does your organization um, have a governance structure? These are all things too. Uh, again, STAR, project approval, they also apply to just BPR um, efforts in general. Um, and as always, um, your, what, what is your, your current business process? What is your as-is state? So I want to emphasize that because the new STAR project is going to to make sure that projects are planned appropriately and that the organization has an understanding of their current state today. Again, the, the business, um, the technology, and the processes. So who's going to be impacted by STAR or this new project approval? It's going to be your business owners, your executives. So uh, your, your executive support is important, what your organizational priorities are. Um, that's important for getting resources assigned. Your business ana analyst and your procurement staff. Procurement now is part of project approval, so that will drive organizations to coordinate a little uh, more tightly um, within uh, their planning efforts. Um, your budgets office, um, preparing BCPs for funding, um, and we're developing what's called now a financial analysis worksheet. So that's all the costing information. It's, it's business costs, IT costs, technology costs. Um, there's no way that one segment of an organization can, can account for that. So they have, all parts of the organization have to work together. Um, also, your PMO will be impacted, your, your project management office. Um, your project management office, uh, typically on the forefront of IT projects, is now in the new process. That may not be successful because that PMO is going to have to reach out to these other areas of the organization. And last but not least is the IT. Um, and I mentioned that last because it's everything before IT that needs to occur. Um, so just a, a little side note, there's a, a Rubik's Cube um, at the Cambria table, and this is a perfect segue into describing that really the Rubik's Cube is basically the different parts of your organization. So when you change one part, it impacts another part of your organization. So we have to think and rethink how we do things and how we operate today and how it affects other parts of our organization. So um, if you want one of these, there's 50 of them available. <laughs> so first come, first serve. Um, but that's just a little little way symbol to think about um, when you go back to your offices. Um, so I have to wrap this up real quick. Um, so I have a couple key points I want you guys to take away with is, um, why should I care? I'm not in IT. Well, I hopefully I answered that question, but it's always about the business first. And BPR is always part of the upfront planning that needs to take place before any technology solution is considered. Um, and also, invest in BPR efforts early. Um, it's a, basically a plan now or pay later, later approach. So if you don't do the planning and the engagement early, you're going to pay later one way or another. And that's what we found in the IT projects, hence the driver for changing or transforming the current project approval process. More information on STAR um, on the back of the, the brochure. Um, you can go to our website or our booth um, out at Cambria or the Department of Technology. And I got a cut. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea, Jerry, Janine, Greg. Um, at this time, I'd like to open it up for any questions. Yes. Thank you. So when do you think that all of the stages are going to be uh, developed? Okay, that's, that's a loaded question because we're phasing it. So phase, stage one and stage two, like um, Ron had mentioned, was released December of uh, 2014. That will be in effect in uh, July of, two, of this year. 
and we will release stage three and four, hopefully, if we do all our BPR efforts right for the project, um, in June for effect, June of this year for stage three of, and four with that effective date being December of 2015. Oh, great. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Sure. Um, well, the advantage that I have in working in the director's office at EDD is I also work on our workforce and succession planning efforts, so I have access to a lot of resources. So our mentoring will come in forms. It's formal and um, informal. Currently with the project that we have now, we do have a consultant um, that provides a lot of training. Um, our, our kickoff meeting, his, he and his team were there, um, provided a lot of training to me as the project manager and then to our teams, as well as to our executives. Um, it was really important to get that training to the executives so that they know this is a lot of what we're going to be bringing. This is the terminology we're going to be speaking. Um, there are times when we want to fall back into our old ways, and I have to say no, and then remind them, and remember, this is our approach and methodology. Uh, with our new team members that are transitioning on, we are actually partnering them up with our current team members. So that's where some of the informal training uh, happens. And then as a project manager, I actually have one-on-ones with all of my team members just to find out, in addition to what they're working on in the project as well, um, what else do they want to work on? Do they want to work on um, be, you know, stronger writing skills? Um, do they want to work on presentation skills? And so throughout the course of the project, while we have this assignment that we're dedicated to, we also incorporate some of those leadership um, development opportunities as well. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Becky. Um, these are uh, multi-year projects. So how do you keep the resources and the enthusiasm over the multiple years to keep it going? I actually have worked on multiple year projects. Um, I, the last project I was on, it was about a five year project and I think I was the third project manager. So you kind of face, yeah, you, you go into it and um, rather than trying to follow in the footsteps of someone else, for me, if it's something I believe in, it's easy. It's it's just wanting to find out, well, what's in it for my team members? What's in it for my, my customer? Um, and then I think checking in with the executive sponsorship, understanding are we still meeting our objective, do we need to recalibrate in any way um, has been helpful as well. But I think that if you have the right team and the right leadership, um, that genuinely believe in the effort, they will be able to maintain that enthusiasm and bring those on board. I personally like uh, when I do have the challenge of someone that doesn't particularly care for it. Um, I probably work them a little bit more, obviously, um, to bring them on board. But I invite that resistance in to find out, well, what is it? Um, why don't you want to see things change? Why do you want to keep using this paper when we can automate this, you know, this particular process? Or why can't we just get rid of the paper? Because are we really using it? Are people really looking at those reports that we keep sending to some anonymous um, um, email inbox? So um, I think that just having the right team, the right leadership, uh, our team Team, we hit some obstacles this week, and um, we powwowed a little bit, and um, lessons learned. How are we going to do things differently? Um, but then we instantly turn around, all right, what's our next step? How are we going to keep this going? And I think that because these um, these are value systems that are intrinsic to my team members and myself, it, it's it's just it's a natural thing for us. I'll also say it's also hard. And the reality is, is that there's stuff all the time that, you know, you read about in the papers, you have to keep, you know, you can reach for the stars, but you still got to keep your feet on the ground, the old case of case. There's, there's, it is hard, you know, and, and I, I just want to be kind of a, not a counter to, but it's like, um, you know, I run, I exercise, I'm out there, I'm, I'm constantly trying to make sure I have enough reserve to be able to give to everybody else. So, I mean, part of it is just ourselves. Right. Thank you, Greg. So with that, it does bring us to the end of our session. I do want to thank everybody for attending. We've tried to touch on some of our top ways to rethink and redesign and really make a difference. Um, in the brochures that you have on your table, uh, we've included kind of our full top 10 list that our team has compiled. And so take a look at those. If you'd like to talk further about any of those, feel free to stop by our Cambria booth downstairs. We'd be happy to um, uh, discuss whatever questions you have a little bit further. But thank you for your time, and uh, have a great rest of your day.